your mic? Yeah. All right. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Uh, I need a clicker though. <laughs> and I think you need to switch the the presentation to mine. So uh, while she's doing that, I'll give you a little bit of my background. First of all, thank you very much. Uh, this is very convenient for me. Uh, I live about two miles away, and I play hockey about a quarter mile away. So. Uh, as opposed to you know, having to go across the country to make a speech, this is very easy for me. Um, my name is Guy Kawasaki. Uh, let me explain who I am. I, I'll, I'll take you back chronologically. So uh, I'm from Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, I went to Stanford. After Stanford, I att attended law school, which means that I didn't graduate. Uh, I actually quit after a couple weeks. And then I went back to Hawaii, and then I came back to the mainland to go to uh, UCLA for an MBA. I started working in a jewelry manufacturing company, literally counting diamonds. And then, fast forward, my classmate from Stanford hired me into Apple, where I was Apple's software evangelist. So this is like 1983, and my job was to convince people to write Macintosh software. Uh, I stayed at the Apple Macintosh division for about four years, then I left to start some companies. Uh, I became a writer and a speaker. I returned to Apple in 1995, because many people thought Apple would die. And so they brought me back as chief evangelist. And I stayed there two more years, and then I left to start uh, Garage.com, which is a boutique investment bank slash venture campus. And now I'm primarily a writer and a speaker. Uh, I will tell you, though, that I can't tell you who it is yet, but next week I'm going to become chief evangelist for a small company from Australia. <coughs> and uh, I will be working for a woman, you'll love this, who is probably she could be, for sure she could be my daughter, chronologically. She could almost be my granddaughter. So, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, I have a very interesting life right now, and it's going to get a lot more interesting. So, uh, I, I'm going to talk to you today about the art of innovation, which is something that I learned working at Apple, as well as an investor and an entrepreneur. Uh, I use a top ten format for my speeches. If you haven't seen me speak before, I always do this. And that's because uh, I've seen so many high-tech speakers, and I can tell you something that uh, most high-tech speakers, and most are male, I suck as speakers. <laughs> and that's one thing, and the second thing is uh, they go long, which is an ironic combination, because you, you think if you suck, you would go short, right? And, uh, so I tell you, if, if you suck and you go short, it's okay, and if you're great and you go long, it's okay, but if you suck and go long, that's like being stupid and arrogant, right? So, and so uh, I use the top 10 format, because that way you can track progress through my speech. So in case you think I suck, you know approximately how much longer I suck. So, so I will go through this presentation. I'll be happy to take all the questions you want because I live only two miles away. Uh, and uh, I also, uh, already mentioned, I uh, brought some gifts. So near that wall, uh, my, my actually, my wife is going to love this. So before I came here tonight, I went through my office. And as an author, and I've written 12 books, Lots of times when a book is translated into various languages, it's in my contract that I get five copies of every language. And I have to tell you that I brought books in languages. I don't even know what language it is. <laughs> so I brought my books over there. Um, I have copies of my most recent book, Eight, in English. Uh, there's also a stack of cards that look like this. So this is a very clever thing. This is a card. If you scratch off the back, it gives you a unique promo code. That unique promo code you redeem at a site, and it'll install the ebook version of Ape. So this is a very clever thing. Um, in a sense, I think it's the future for self-published authors. That if this is, there's a stack there. I think about there's one for everybody. I think. And you know, would I have brought? four boxes of books that weigh two pounds each? Honestly, no. But I can bring a stack of cards like this. It's a, this is a beautiful thing. And um, it has all the advantages, particularly when you travel. Uh, you can take this, you know, 500 cards very easily. And you can sign this, you can autograph this, because people want an autograph. That's one of the disadvantages of an e-book. Well, I can autograph this for you. It's just like a baseball card in that sense. So um, those are my gifts. I also, while I was you know, looking at all this stuff I could give away, I found other author books 
because lots of authors send me multiple copies of their book. I don't know why. So this is not a reflection of the quality of the book there. They just happen to send me a lot, so I put those over there. And finally, uh, I've been affiliated with some companies. I've been helping some companies like, um, well, one is Canva, which I'll talk about. Uh, I have a website called All Top, and the book Ape, I made t-shirts. I have extra t-shirts over there. And so my wife is going to be so happy because I just cleaned out all this stuff. <laughs> so, yeah, so it kills two birds with one stone. The only thing you cannot have over there is my laundry basket. Right? <laughs> I do need the laundry basket, okay? So, um, let me start. I uh, learned most of what I know about innovation from, honestly, Steve Jobs. Uh, Steve Jobs was a remarkable person. Um, every story you heard about Steve is true good and bad. And uh, I don't think I would be where I am were it not for him. Uh, he pushed me to do things that I never thought I would be able to do. Uh, I, yeah, really, I, he kind of made me. I don't think I would, might still be counting diamonds if it were not for Steve Jobs. And so I owe him a great uh, debt of gratitude. Uh, not that I agreed with everything he did, but he was a remarkable person. I can pretty much guarantee you that right now he is telling God what to do. <laughs> so, if you see Steve Jobs reincarnated, it's because God could not stand him anymore. Uh, which is highly likely. So, so, this reflects all these lessons, okay? So, let's start off here. So, uh, first, I have to figure out this thing. And you would think that if you, oh, okay. I thought this is Microsoft Windows remote. <laughs> so you have to hold down three keys to make it go forward. Right? So uh, step number one, step number one in the art of innovation is to decide that you want to make meaning as opposed to make money. Uh, many of the entrepreneurs that I've been affiliated with, they think that the reason to start a company is to make money. And I would differ. I think the reason to start a company is to make meaning, to change the world, to make the world a better place. And if you happen to do that, one of the consequences of making meaning is you also make money. But if you start a company for the primary purpose of making money, you will probably fail. And one of the main reasons you'll probably fail is you'll attract the wrong kind of employees because you'll attract employees who only want to make money as opposed to meaning and history. So I think this is step number one, and I'm going to read you what I think is one of the most meaningful advertisings I've ever seen. A woman is often measured by the things she cannot control. She is measured by the way her body curves or doesn't curve. Where right? she is flat or straight or round, she is measured by 36, 24, 36, and inches and ages and numbers, by all the outside things that don't ever add up to who she is on the inside. And so if a woman is to be measured, let her be measured by the things she can control, by who she is, and who she is trying to become, because as every woman knows, measurements are only statistics, and statistics lie. And I think this is just the greatest advertising copy ever written. And it is written for Nike women's aerobic shoes, right? So this was an ad for two pieces of cotton, leather, and rubber. Now, let's pretend that you're my target market. I'll be the VP of marketing of Nike, okay? So I say to you, do you have $100? Yes. Say yes, yeah. Help the speaker here. <laughs> I want for you. Okay, I can see that. So I've qualified her. So now here's my pitch. I know you have $100. You give me the $100. I give you two pieces of cotton, leather, rubber manufactured under somewhat suspect conditions in China. <laughs> and that's obviously not the Nike pitch. Nike is positioning two pieces of cotton, leather, and rubber to stand for efficacy and power and liberation. It's not two pieces of cotton, leather, rubber. They're making meaning with shoes. And that's the test. Nike can make meaning with shoes. So, let's look at some examples of companies and the meaning they make. Number one, Apple. I think Apple, the meaning they make is they have basically changed the world with computers. They have brought computers to everybody. They have changed the world. Next thing, Google. Google has brought information. It's democratized information. You know, it's, it's making all the information in the world accessible. Uh, eBay. eBay has democratized commerce so that you didn't have to be Target or Walmart. You could be one person making dolls or making 
I don't know, custom wheels, whatever it is, making iPod cases, and you could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with any other retailer. They democratize commerce. And finally, there's YouTube, which democratized video. Now you didn't have to be a studio to upload and share and sell video. So this is an example of four companies and the kind of meaning they made. All very successful. I would make the case it's because they made meaning, therefore they made money. Which is very different than thinking, well, if we can figure out a way to make money, we might also make meaning. Which came first? I think the meaning. Next thing is, you need to make a mantra for your organization. A mantra is a short two or three word description of why your company should exist. Uh, most companies do a mission statement. This is the mission of Wendy's. The mission of Wendy's is to deliver superior quality products and services for our customers and communities through leadership, innovation, and partnerships. Okay, now, don't get me wrong. I have nothing against Wendy's. I have four children. When the children outnumber the adults in your family, when you've gone from man to man to zone, it is a whole different world, right? So we've eaten at Wendy's, we've driven through Wendy's, we've stopped at Wendy's, french fries are our favorite vegetable. Uh, but in all those times that I've been at Wendy's, it has never occurred to me that what I am participating in is leadership, innovation, and partnerships. I must admit. And one of the fundamental flaws of this kind of mission statement is if you took the name of that company off that mission statement, in a million years, you would not guess that that's the mission statement of Wendy's, right? It's also too long. I don't think there's an employee of Wendy's who could repeat that verbatim. Not even the founder could repeat that. I know that because he's dead. But, but this is the problem. So like, let's, let's like deconstruct mission statements. Let's, how many of you have ever been on a corporate retreat to make a mission statement? Oh. What an awful, okay. So let's just discuss how that, so for those of you who have not, can I sit down, it's been a long day. Um, <laughs> the way it works is you have an off-site. It's usually at some place like the Ritz-Carlton Half Moon Bay. It has a very high correlation between golf course and mission statement. <laughs> so it's at the Ritz-Carlton Half Moon Bay. You take the top 40, 50 employees of your company, and uh, you hire an outside meeting facilitator. Uh, not to be sexist, but it's usually a woman. Uh, that's because women are frankly better at making this kind of meeting work. Uh, you know, her name is Moonbeam. <laughs> Honestly, she's on a dual track career. She's a Lamaze instructor and an executive coach because the process is the same. You need to push out a mission statement, you need to push out a baby, same thing. So now Moonbeam leads the 50 people through the first day of outdoor exercises where you form teams cross-functional with the people you cannot stand at your company. And you learn to trust each other, you close your eyes, you fall into each other's arms, you know, hallelujah, kumbaya, right? The second day you're in a room like this is a pad of paper, and with Moonbeam you create this mission statement. Now there's 50 people in the room, they figured out, they, they've given two days of their lives doing this stupid off-site, so they each figure they deserve one word in the mission statement. So that's how come mission statements are 50 words long. So I think this is fundamentally flawed. And what you should do is you should create a two or three word mantra for why you exist. Here's some examples. I think the mantra of Wendy's should be healthy fast food. In three words they could describe why they exist. That's what they're trying to do. Healthy fast food. If you're Nike, Nike's slogan, world's greatest slogan is just do it. But why does the company exist? I think it's for authentic athletic performance. Next example, FedEx. FedEx exists for peace of mind when you absolutely positively want something, someplace. So my second step for you is try to figure out two or three words that describe why you should exist. If you're eBay, you democratize commerce. If you're Google, you democratize information. Two or three words, that's the limit. No corporate offsite, no 50 words, two or three words. A very good test for your mantra is if you ask the receptionist of your company, why does your company exist? They should say, we democratize commerce, we democratize information, we democratize design, whatever it is. That's the good test for a mantra. Okay, step three is a matter of perspective. And I think great innovation occurs when you don't stay on the same curve, but you jump to the next curve. Historical example. 
Ice 1.0 was the ice harvesting business. In the ice harvesting business, Bubba and Junior would go to a frozen lake or a pond in the winter, in a cold city, cut blocks of ice. They used saws, horses, and sleighs. That was Ice 1.0. Ice 2.0 was the ice factory 30 years later. Now you froze water centrally and the ice man delivered ice in the ice truck. This is a major technological breakthrough. It did not have to be a cold city. It did not have to be a cold season. You could have an ice factory anywhere. That is a big deal. Ice 3.0 is the refrigerator curve. Now you didn't have to have the ice delivered to your house. You had your own personal ice factory. You had your own refrigerator, your own PC, your own personal chiller. The very interesting historical fact is that none of the ice harvesters became ice factories and none of the ice factories became refrigerator companies. And why is that? It's because most companies define themselves in terms of what they already do. So Bubba and Junior, they thought they were in the business of hitching up a sleigh to a horse, getting a saw, waiting for winter, cutting a block of ice. That's how they define their business. If you were an ice factory, you define your business as we freeze water centrally, we put it in a truck, and we deliver it. And if you're in the refrigerator business, you define your business as we make a mechanical contraption to refrigerate food. The problem with that thinking is that they really need to step back and ask yourself, now, it's not the process of our business, it's the benefit. And in each case, whether it's ice one, two, or three, the benefit is the same, it's cleanliness and convenience. So you would think that if you are an ice harvester and you see an ice factory, you would think that they would say, hmm, you know, we're not in the ice harvesting business per se, we're in the business of providing cleanliness and convenience for our customers. This is a better way. We should freeze water centrally rather than wait for winter and cut blocks of ice. If you're an ice factory owner, you would think you would see a refrigerator and say, hmm, this is a better way. Right now, our truck can deliver you know, within 50 miles. But there are many, many more people who are outside of this radius of 50 miles. And frankly, it's just not efficient to freeze water and drive it to people. Imagine if they could have their own personal ice factory or refrigerator. Let's get out of the ice factory business and get into the refrigerator business. But nobody thinks like that. And so if you truly want to be innovative, you need to get to the next curve or create the next curve. Don't just duke it out on the same curve. If you're a letter quality printer company, don't make more forms of Helvetica daisy wheel printers, right? Make a laser printer. If you're a laser printer company, look at 3D printing. If you're a telegraph company, look at telephones. If you're a telephone company, look at VoIP. Get to the next curve. The fourth thing is to roll the dicey. Um, these are the five qualities that I think make great products. Quality number one is depth. Great products are deep, lots of features, lots of functionality. You know, by the way, those of you who are taking pictures of the slides, I'll give you the PDF. You don't need to you know, take pictures. That's like not too efficient. I'll, I'll, I'll make the PDF available. Um, so this is an example of a deep product. This is a fanning reef sandal. And this sandal has twice the depth of any other sandal because every sandal in the world has one primary function, protect your feet. That metal clip in the middle area of the sandal, the purpose of that is to open beer bottles. <laughs> this sandal has twice the functionality, twice the depth of any other sandal in the world. Protects your feet and opens beer bottles. The I stands for intelligent. When you look at a great product or service, you will conclude, or you should conclude, that this company has it together. This company understood my pain. This company understood what I needed. This is an example. So this is a GT500 Shelby Mustang. It has 650 horsepower. If you're not familiar with what that means, I'll translate it. It's 6.8 Priuses. Okay? So this is truly a badass Mustang. Um, I am 59 years old, going through a midlife crisis, feelings of inadequacy, impotency, you know, all the stuff that men go through. I would love to buy one of these cars to compensate for my feelings of inadequacy. <laughs> Having said that, I have two older boys who are drivers, they're 18 and 21, one's in college, one's a senior in high school, and the thought of either of them driving around the Bay Area in a car with 650 horsepower is immoral. I mean, it's just wrong <laughs> to, to give kids a car like this or let them use a car like this. 
Uh, but Ford has a very intelligent product called the MyKey. And what the MyKey does is it enables you to program the top speed of the car into the key, right? So when dad is going out of town and we're dropping him at SFO, yeah, okay, drop me off in the Mustang. But you're gonna have a key that's programmed to go no faster than 55. <laughs> I think that is a very intelligent product. Right? By the way, if you choose to do this, um, understand that it controls the top speed of a car, not how long it takes to get to the top speed. <laughs> uh, the next thing is a great product, I love cars, are complete. So when you buy a Lexus, it's not just the steel and the rubber and the leather, right? It's the totality of the Lexus experience, after sales support. And the first E is for empowering. I think that great products empower people, they don't fight people. So this is the difference between Macintosh and Windows. Macintosh becomes one with you. It empowers you. It makes you more creative and productive. By contrast, Windows, you have to wrestle to the ground in defeat. Like, have you ever met anybody who said, yeah, my Windows laptop and I, we're one with each other. We're completing each other's sentences. It makes me more productive and more creative. You know, anybody like that feel, anybody feel like that about their Windows laptop? Yeah, never. You do? Oh, you're so sad. Right? <laughs> Let me show you a Macintosh. <laughs> okay, so one out of a hundred. That's what the market share should be. But anyway, that's a different discussion. The last E is elegance. The great products are elegant. Somebody cared about the user interface design. So, as you try to jump curves, I want you to ask yourself constantly, are we creating something that's deep, intelligent, complete, empowering, and elegant? Are we properly rolling the dicey? Next step is to don't worry, be crappy. This is stolen from a song by Bobby McFerrin. Um, I think that revolutionaries and innovators don't worry, be crappy. Which is to say that if you have jump curves, the first permutation of your revolution can have elements of crappiness to it. Okay? I'm not saying ship crap. I'm saying that version one of a great revolution can have elements of crappiness to it. Macintosh version one had 128K of memory. And that's an unfathomably low number, right? I have a 16 gigabyte MacBook Pro. Um, I have, uh, God, the first Macintosh, it had a 400K floppy drive. You can barely fit one font in that today. Um, we were working on a hard disk that was state of the art, it was five megabytes. Five megabytes. And we were wondering, what are people going to do with all that storage? My God, five megabytes. What could they do with all that storage? So you can make a case that version one of Macintosh in 1984 was a piece of crap, but it was a revolutionary piece of crap, right? At the time, it was better than the best MS-DOS machine or the best Apple II. I'm not saying it was perfect, just like the first ice factory wasn't perfect and the first refrigerator wasn't perfect, the first laser printer wasn't perfect, but it was already better than the daisy wheel printer. And the first telephone was hardly perfect, you had to have somebody pull out the plug and put it into another, but it was still so much better than the best telegraph. So again, I'm not saying ship crap. I'm saying that you should ship a revolution, a curve jumping revolution that can have elements of crappiness to it. Next step is to let a hundred flowers blossom. Uh, this I stole from Chairman Mao, although I don't think he quite implemented it. Or if anything, he let a hundred flowers blossom and then cut them off. Uh, but what I mean here is that at the start of great innovation, you take your best shot at branding and positioning, and then you ship your product, and then you basically pray. And you pray that it's embraced, and you pray that it's adopted, and oftentimes, if God answers your prayer, it will be people using your product or service in ways you did not intend, and even the people who are using it are not in your target market. And lots of companies freak out when this happened. My God, the wrong people are buying our products in large quantities. Okay. So my first piece of advice for you is this ever happens to you, step one as an entrepreneur is take the money. Always take the money. 
Step two is to ask the people who are buying your innovation, why are they buying it, and give them more reasons, which is different than asking the people who are not buying your product, why they're not buying it, and try to fix it for them. I don't think that works nearly as well as asking the people who are buying the product, why are they buying it, and give them more reasons. So in a Macintosh context, the thing that I think really saved Apple was desktop publishing. Because Apple was trying to make Macintosh a spreadsheet database and a processing machine in the mid 80s. And if you remember back then, um, we would be zero for three there. And what saved Apple was that Macintosh was very good for desktop publishing. And I, I kind of think that all this page record was a gift from God to Apple. It literally saved Apple. And, you know, just imagine a world without Apple today, right? So we'd all have phones with real keypads. <laughs> We'd have phones where the battery lasted for more than six hours. We'd have phones where the GPS actually got us to the place we wanted to go to. Uh, it would be a different world, right? And, you know, I, I truly do believe in God. And one of the reasons why is there is no other explanation for Apple survival than the existence of a benevolent God. So, it's because Apple let a hundred flowers blossom. We thought we had a spreadsheet database and a word processing machine. Luckily, there was a flower that blossomed called desktop publishing, and it saved Apple. And I learned a very valuable lesson. I'll give you another example, more analog example. Um, let's suppose that you're the VP of marketing of Avon. And you come out with this new product called Skin So Soft. And what's the positioning for Skin So Soft? It's to make you soft and luscious and beautiful, right? But then you find out that lots of moms are buying Skin So Soft to use as an insect repellent because it's less heinous than, say, slathering DDT on your kids, okay? So now, you're the VP of marketing of Avon. What do you do? Do you call up Moonbeam and have another off-site? I say, these women are buying, you know, skin so soft for the wrong reason. We want them to buy it for moisture and beauty, and they're buying it as an insect repellent. My advice to you is, again, take the money. Let a hundred flowers blossom. And if people want to use it for insect repellent and not for beauty, hallelujah, declare victory. Uh, always, always, always take the body and let a hundred flowers blossom. You, you would be lucky if any flowers blossom. So when flowers blossom, don't be, I guess, arrogant. Don't have too much pride. Don't be foolish. If the market says it's an insect repellent, declare victory. If the market says it's a desktop publishing machine, declare victory. Declare victory. Always try to declare victory. Next thing is to polarize people. Now, I'm not saying you should intentionally piss people off, but one of the consequences of great products is that it polarizes people. Some people love it and some people hate it. Some people love Macintosh, some people hate Macintosh, inconceivable as that is. <laughs> Some people love TiVo, some people hate TiVo. I love TiVo. Um, our house has four TiVos in it. It's kind of hard to imagine. I'm the only person in California who admits to love to watch TV. And, um, and, I, and I don't want to give you a false impression that I'm watching PBS all the time. I mean, you know, my favorite shows are stuff like 24 and Boston Legal and, you know, House of Cards and Orange is the New Black. I'm not watching PBS a lot. So, the people who hate TiVo are, guess who? Large brands and their agencies. Because people who own TiVos, we only watch advertising one afternoon a year, which is Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> Arguably, that's the day you should watch the ads and not the game. Um, <laughs> And so there are people who dislike TiVo because it time shifts and it lets you skip ads. But there are people like me who love TiVo. So I'm not saying you should intentionally piss people off, but one of the consequences of great innovation is that you will definitely spark strong emotion. The worst case is not that some people hate you. The worst case is that nobody cares. That's the absolute worst case. If you have people who love you and you have some people who hate you, again, declare victory. That is a good situation. Next thing, churn baby churn. This is stolen from the Black Panthers. Although they said burn baby burn, I think that innovators churn baby churn. And what I mean by this is that you have to ship a revolution and then you have to churn it. 
You have to make your revolution 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 1.4, 1 1.5, 2.0. And I'll tell you, I think this is the hardest part of being an innovator. Because to be an innovator, you need to be in denial. The reason why you need to be in denial is because lots of people are going to tell you your, your innovation isn't necessary, can't work, won't be successful, blah, blah, blah. And if you listen to those people, you would never be an entrepreneur, right? You would just stay working at some other large company. So to be an entrepreneur, you have to be in denial. You have to be able to ignore those bozos. But once you shift, then you have to flip a bit and now you have to go from ignoring people to listening to people so you can properly churn your product. That if people say Macintosh needs slots, you need to add slots. If people say Macintosh needs color, you need to add color. This is the hardest thing to go from ignoring what people are telling you to listening to what people are telling you. It's one of the hardest things for a revolutionary. But it is about churn, baby, churn. The next thing is to niche thyself. This is all the marketing you need to know. I want to sneeze any second now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> niching thyself. So, you don't have to get an MBA, I can teach you all the marketing you need to know. Alright, very simple chart. Vertical axis, uniqueness, horizontal axis, value. This is a two by two matrix. Any of you ever worked for McKinsey? <laughs> any of you ever like been through a half million dollar McKinsey presentation where they make a two by two, presentation, two by two chart and they charge you half a million dollars to tell you, you need to be in the upper right hand corner. All right? Okay. I'm telling you that too. You need to be in the upper right hand corner. I'm telling you that for free. So, as, as an aside, I tell you, I've sat through many, many an entrepreneur presentation and the way they label the axes to put themselves in the upper right hand corner is just comical. It's like, I've sat in presentations where the vertical axis is um, number of ex Google employees, and the horizontal axis is number of German cars, or you know, something like that. So, so we're, you know, we're special, we're defensible because we have the highest number of ex Google employees driving German cars. And we're in the upper right hand corner, the McKinsey corner. Okay? Well, let's go through the three, the four corners of this. First, in the bottom right corner, that's where you've created something of value, but it is not different. You slap the same operating system on the same hardware. You have to compete on price. It is fundamentally the same. You can make a lot of money in this corner if you can fight the margin pressure. If you can do that, if you can fight on costs, hallelujah. I think it's a tough corner to be in. At least you can make money, but it is a tough corner to be in. The next corner is the upper left-hand corner. In the upper left-hand corner, that's where you created something truly unique, but it is of no value. In that corner, you are just plain stupid. You own a market that doesn't exist. The bottom left corner is even worse. This is what I call the dot-com corner. In the dot-com corner, you have created something of no value, and stupid investors have created other companies that do the same stupid, valueless thing. Case in point, Pets.com. So Pets.com, let's talk about Pets.com. This is 12 years ago or whatever. So Pets.com, let me give you the pitch for Pets.com. And if any of you ever use this kind of logic, you deserve not to be funded. Okay, so Pets.com pitch. 300 million Americans, one in four owns a dog, 75 million dogs. Each dog eats two cans of dog food per day. Total addressable market of 150 million cans of dog food per day. With my roommate CTO rock star programmer, how hard could it be to get a mere 1% of this market? 1% of 150 million cans of dog food per day is one and a half million. Let's say we make 25 cents per can. That's $400,000 per day in profit with a mere conservative, worst case, 1% market share, right? So now we're making $400,000 a day. And dog food, unlike B2B, is a very good business because dogs eat every day of the year. It's not like B2B where Enterprises don't work on Saturdays and Sundays, and there's a long purchase uh, evaluation process, and you have to go through corporate standards. This is a good business, B2C. Dogs eat every day of the year. So let's take our $400,000 in profit every day and multiply by 365. 
and we get roughly you know, 160, 170 million dollar a year business. Conservatively speaking, worst case, okay? That's the pitch for Pets.com. So now let's dig deeper into the Pets.com model. So the pet business, pet food business is fundamentally very simple. You have a dog and you have a cow. You need to kill the cow, cut it into pieces, put it in a can, get it to the dog. That's it, supply chain management. <laughs> so we looked at the inefficiencies in this supply chain of getting dead pieces of cows to dogs. And we saw the pet food store. What purpose does the pet food stores truly serve? Do people enjoy getting in their cars, looking for parking, getting into the store? In the store, do they make an informed purchase? Are they tasting the dead cows in cans? They don't open the can, they look at the label, it's dead cows in cans, okay? So why don't we disintermediate the pet food store? Then we can discount pet food 25%. Hallelujah! Well, the problem with that and the, the lack of value proposition is yes, you can discount dog food 25%, but Physically, it still has to get to someone's house. And so now, you have to pay shipping and handling. And shipping and handling on dead cows and cans is very high. And it's also not nearly as convenient sometimes because someone has to be home when UPS drops off the dead cow in the can. This means that Pets.com is not so valuable after all. It's really not that much cheaper and not that much convenience. Okay, then to look at the supply side of Pets.com and its competitors, you know, if, if, if you're a venture capitalist and you say, wow, Sequoia funded Pets.com, Heiner Perkins funded MyPets.com, you know, uh, we need our Pets.com in our portfolio because after all, there are freaking 75 million dogs in America eating two cans of dog food per day, a total addressable market of 150 million cans of dog food per day, and they're eating that every stinking day. Surely there's a market that we can have Pets.com, MyPets.com, ePets.com, LastInPets.com, and DiscountPets.com. So there are like six ways to spend as much money as, at the pet food store as online and being inconvenienced by having to be at home when the dead cow in the can was dropped off. That's why the dot-com corner is neither valuable nor unique. That's the worst corner of all. So the corner you want to be in, of course, is the upper right-hand corner. And in that upper right-hand corner, there are companies. Some very simple examples for you. Um, Fandango. I love Fandango. I love to take my kids to movies. I hate standing in line with them. I hate not going to a movie and finding out that it's sold out, right? So for where we go to movies, that's the only movie ticket buying service I can use. They have a monopoly on that theater. I pay a buck and a half per ticket not to have to stand in line and to know that I have a ticket before I go. That to me is a unique and valuable service, Fandango. Another example, Brightling Emergency Watch. This is a Brightling Emergency Watch. If I unscrew this big knob here, pull out, there's an antenna. That antenna broadcasts the emergency signal to airplanes. So this is not something you do when you took the wrong exit off 101. You know, you're supposed to take Marsh and you took you know, Woodside, right? So you do this when you're about to die. You skied off the track, you're on a boat, and you know, you're all, you lost your rudder, I don't know, whatever it is. So this is one of the few watches in the world that can literally save your life. This is unique, and if you're about to die, it is very valuable, right? So, by the way, if you buy one of these watches and you pull this out, just so you know, it's like a quarter million dollar fine if you do it and it's a false alarm. This is a big thing because you pull this out and like, you know, 10 minutes later, Kevin Costner is getting in a helicopter looking for you. This is a big problem. So don't do this casually, all right? Uh, another example, this is a smart car. So many of us have cars that can park parallel to the curb. How many of you have a car that can park perpendicular to the curb. This is a unique and valuable service if you don't have a lot of parking where you live. So these are all simple examples of companies and products that are unique and valuable. Number 10. Number 10 is to be sure you perfect your pitch. I'm sure you'll learn lots about pitching. Let me give you one perspective on pitching. Oops. First thing is you need to customize your introduction. In the venture capitalist uh, scenario here, it means that you have to know who the heck you're pitching to, right? You need to know who's in their portfolio, who's in the room, what their interests are. You know, go on to LinkedIn, 
Stalk them on social media. See what they just posted. Did they just come back from Scotland playing golf? You know, did they just buy a Tesla? Find out who they are. Customize your pitch. Know who you're talking to. If you have all enterprise people in your room and you're talking about, you know, B2C, you, you did something wrong. You need to customize your pitch. Um, I like to customize my pitch or my presentations using pictures. Um, I never pitch VCs anymore, but when I speak, I use pictures. This is an example. So this is a picture of my LG washer and dryer. So the scenario here is that I was in South America to speak to the LG management. And uh, after I got to Brazil, I figured out that, you know, guy, you're talking to LG. If you really had your act together, you would have taken a picture of your LG washer and dryer so you could open up your speech with an LG washer and dryer speaking to LG. How cool is that, right? Uh, but I, I wasn't that smart. So I sent a text message to my two older boys, the ones I don't want driving a Mustang, and I thought I'd invoke a little reciprocation. So I tell them, you know, just pause Call of Duty on the Xbox that I bought you, in the house that I bought you, and go downstairs with the iPhones that I bought you, and take a picture of the washer and dryer that I bought you, and send it to me right away because I'm about to make a speech in Brazil. Okay. How many of you have teenage boys in this audience? Okay, so guess what happens? Nothing. Right? Exactly. Okay, so now let's set the stage for the next slide. I have two boys. Older boy is Nick. Younger boy is Noah. Okay? Nick is at Cal right now. Noah is at Sacred Heart. He's a senior. So, I send a follow-up text message to my older boy, Nick. I said, Nick, did you get my text messages? Nick responds, Noah's going to go take the pictures. By the way, can you get us some free TVs? <laughs> Now, there's a lot of lessons here. <laughs> Lesson number one is sometimes you need to say no as a parent. <laughs> Lesson number two is you, like Nick, should always be closing. Nick was asking for a TV. You need to ask for the sale. And the third thing, the third little bubble there, you might not be able to read, is my response to it, which is I don't think so. No TV for you. My point here is to customize your introduction. I'll show you some examples. So when I was in Russia speaking, I opened up with this slide. And I basically said, wow, I had no idea. You Russians, you really have big balls. <laughs> and this is before Crimea. Next thing, this is my favorite one. This is me in the Grand Bazaar of Istanbul. How many of you have been to Istanbul? Istanbul, I think, is the most enchanting city in the world, is it not? I mean, even without Twitter. Arguably, without Twitter, it's more enchanting. Right? <laughs> Less aggravation, no social media. I can focus on not doing digital stuff. So, uh, the scenario here is that the guy behind me is the shopkeeper. And as you can tell, that guy is not faking happiness. <laughs> that guy is truly happy. And you know why he's truly happy? You know what he's thinking? He's thinking, this dumb-ass American is going to buy this fez. <laughs> this fez has been in my family shop for three generations. And I finally found an American stupid enough to buy this fez. So trust me when I tell you, when you're speaking to Turkcell in Istanbul, and you open up with this picture, showing yourself in the Grand Bazaar, wearing a fez, the speech goes very well. Customize your introduction. Next thing, you need to follow the 10-20-30 rule. The 10-20-30 rule of Guy Kawasaki is that the optimal number of slides in a PowerPoint presentation is 10. 10. You'll be lucky to get 10 points across in a presentation, honestly. 10 slides. Now, you may be looking and thinking indignantly that I'm a hypocrite because I am way past 10 in this presentation, right? So let me explain. You are not me. 10 slides. You should be able to give these 10 slides in 20 minutes. Why 20 minutes when most meetings are an hour? It's because, how many of you use Windows laptops in this room? 
<laughs> Hold your hands up high. You should be proud of the fact that you're oppressed. <laughs> okay. So, if the whole world used Macintosh, this would not be the 10, 20, 30 rule. It would be the 10, 60, 30 rule. Because if the whole world used Macintosh, everybody could make their Macintosh work with the projector immediately. <laughs> I know that people who use Windows laptops, they need 40 minutes to make it work with the projector. Okay? So that's why I had to subtract 40 from 60 and get 20. So to make it the most general case, I had to compensate for the fact that people with Windows laptops need 40 minutes to make it work with the projector. And the last thing is the ideal font size. I think the ideal font size is roughly 30 points. Uh, I hate slides with 8, 10, or 12 points. Usually when people do that, they start reading the slides. And the problem with reading your slide is that one slide into your presentation, your audience is going to figure out this bozo is reading his slides. <laughs> Verbatim. And frankly, I can read it to myself silently faster than this bozo can read them to me. So I will just read ahead and you'll lose your audience. If you think that 30 points is too dogmatic, I'll give you a rule of thumb. Figure out who the oldest person is in your audience and divide his or her age by two. Pitching to a 60-year-old VC, divide by two, 30 points. Pitching to a 50-year-old VC, divide by two, 25 points. Pitching to a 16-year-old VC, God bless you, that day you see 8-point font, okay? <laughs> but until that day, 10 slides, 20 minutes, 30-point font. Next thing, 11th, bonus for you. Always over-promise and under-deliver. No, always over-deliver and under-promise. Number 11 is do not let the bozos grind you down. Bozos are going to try to grind you down. They're going to tell you it can't be done, it shouldn't be done, whatever, right? You know? And there's nothing more depressing and aggravating than this attitude. Um, uh, let me tell you about bozos. There are two kinds of bozos in the world. One bozo is disgusting, physically disgusting, pathetic person, pocket protector. Japanese watch, rusty car. And you look at that person and you say, you are a loser. That bozo is not dangerous because you look at that bozo and you say, ah, loser. Only a loser listens to a loser. So by definition, since you're not losers, you're not gonna listen to a loser bozo. That's why the loser bozo is not dangerous. The dangerous bozo is the winner bozo. The winner bozo dressed in all black, you know, Jean-Paul Gaultier. Lots of stuff that ends in I, like Armani, Ferrari, Lamborghini, Maserati. Audi is okay. And so you look at this person, you know, with Armani, Jimmy Chu, Kate Spade, all the good stuff, and you say, huh, this person is rich, this person is famous, therefore, this person must be smart. I will tell you that that is a very dangerous line of reasoning, that I think at least 50% of the time, rich and famous parses to lucky, not smart. So this is the dangerous bozo because you might be tempted to listen to someone who is rich and famous. So I believe that bozosity is like the flu. And so what you need to do is you need to inoculate yourself from bozosity by getting a little bit of bozosity in advance. So when you encounter it, you are already prepared intellectually to not listen to it. So I'm going to give you some bozosity. Velocity number one, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. The chairman of IBM allegedly said this in 1943. I have five Macs in my house. I have all the computers he anticipated in the world in my house. Imagine if, you know, Steve Jobs asked Tom Watson for advice. And Tom Watson said, son, the whole market for computers in the world is five. Why would you start Apple? This telephone has no, 
This telephone has too many shortcomings to be, serious, to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. Western Union Internal Memo, 1876. So in 1876, Western Union already wrote off telephony. Hmm, that was perhaps a bit premature. Now, how many of you use Western Union right now? How many of you use eBay? How many of you use PayPal? Right, so why isn't Western Union PayPal? That's a good question, right? Well, maybe it's because Western Union couldn't go from telegraph to internet because it got stuck on telephones. It was just too big a chasm to cross. Now, for all we know, the MBA is running Western Union in 1876. They decided the strategic marketing direction would be, in 1877, let's teach Americans the Morse code. <laughs> How hard could that be? We'll teach Americans the Morse code, then we can put a telegraph in every house. If we just get 1% of the Americans with the telegraph, do you know how big that business would be, right? That's bozosity. Western Union wrote off telephony. <sighs> There's no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home. This is Ken Olson. He was a great entrepreneur, great innovator, changed the world, took us from mainframes to minis. But he was so successful on the mini computer curve, he could not embrace the personal computer curve. This would be like saying, if you own the most ice factories in America, would you embrace refrigerators? Probably not, right? You want to freeze water centrally. You don't want people to have their own refrigerators, you want them to have to come to you and get ice. Imagine if Steve or Waz had met Ken Olson and asked Mr. Olson, so we're gonna make a personal computer, Mr. Olson. It's gonna be smaller, and cheaper, and easier to use than a deck mini computer. And Mr. Olson would have said, there's no reason why anybody would want a computer in their home. I mean, if you wanted to balance your checkbook, just drive back to the office and use Quicken running on a deck mini computer. And if they had listened, if they had had that conversation, there would have been no Apple. This is bozosity. I'll tell you one more example of bozosity. I can't remember if I have the slide for this or not. I do not. The last example of bozosity is my own personal bozosity. So my personal bozosity is that Mike Moritz, about 15 years ago, 15 years, six days, seven hours, and 25 minutes, called me up and he says, Guy, I just funded a company. I want you to interview for the CEO position of it. He told me who the company was. I looked at its website. I looked at where it was. I said, Mike, um, my wife and I are living in San Francisco. We have a son. She's in beta with our second son. <laughs> and I just, I don't want to drive from San Francisco down to Menlo Park every day or down to Stanford every day. It's like a one hour drive. And also, I look at their website, and I don't see anything that's special about it. There's no proven management team. There's no proven business model. There's no proven patent pending curve jumping technology. I'm not even interested in interviewing. Okay, so I basically turned down the opportunity to interview for the first real CEO of Yahoo. Now, Yahoo obviously is an interesting place now, but let us remember, for the first you know, 15 or 20 years of Yahoo, it was an uh, ex excellent, outstanding company. And so, let's roll back history and play with me for a while. And let's say that I did get the interview. I did take the interview. The interview was offered to me. And furthermore, let's say that I got the job. Because once a VC on the, on the board of director calls you and asks you for an interview for the job, he's already made his decision. He's not going to call up somebody to ask for the interview for someone he's going to reject, right? So let's say I got the job. Okay, so what would, my, what would my deal have been to be the first adult CEO of Yahoo? 10%. Let's say 10%. 10% vesting over four years. But then let's be conservative. Let's say that two years into a four-year vesting schedule, I reached the height of my incompetence, right? And so Yahoo needs a new CEO, someone who can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the moguls in Hollywood and the moguls in New York. And so there's this emergency board meeting and they say, Guy, you know, we're gonna 
replace you as a CEO effective today. We don't think you can take Yahoo to the next level. And and nothing. I mean, they, you know, they would have fired you. And I'll tell you what I would have done. I would have said, you know, well, let's just time out here. I don't know if you realize this board, but I'm Japanese American. And as a Japanese American, I'm gonna press my RV. <laughs> <laughs> so, as an oppressed minority, you know, honestly, you cannot fire me. <laughs> and, 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 like, you know, just think of the public sentiment. So let's just review history for a while. So, in World War II, America was fighting Germany, Italy, and Japan. Did America take the German Americans and stick them in internment camps? No. Did they go to New York and take all the Italians and stick them in internment camps? No. But you took all the Japanese and stuck them in desert camps, right? Okay. Data point number one. <laughs> Data point number two. Near the end of the war, this peace-loving nation called America, they dropped not one, but two atomic weapons on what country? Japan. And now you're firing me. We're seeing a trend here. <laughs> So the board would have said, time out, guy. You know, what would it take for you to go away quietly? And I would have said, you know what? You've already allocated 10% of Yahoo to me. Why don't you just accelerate my vesting? Just give me all the stock. I'll sign a non-compete, non-disparagement, non-everything. You know, and I'll go away quietly. Just give me the other 5%. And they would have agreed to it. So by my calculation, that response refusing to even interview cost me roughly two billion dollars. <laughs> now, two billion here, two billion there. After a while, it adds up to real money. <laughs> so, so I've been thinking about this bozosity of mine for about 15 years, six weeks, seven hours from now, you know, 45 minutes. And I, I, honestly, I've, I've, not totally, but I've, kind of come to peace with it. Um, and the rationale is that I was there with my wife as we raised our children. I was not flying all over this world making Yahoo successful. So in a sense, what I did is I picked my family over making money. I picked my family over money, which is an admiral decision, right? So you should clap right here. Right? <laughs> so, here's the problem. That explains one billion. <laughs> From the bottom of my heart, I tell you that the part that pisses me off is the second billion. <laughs> because the second billion shows that I too was a bozo, right? Because I looked at their website, Yahoo's early website, was nothing more than a directory of Jerry and David's favorite websites. So what was defensible about that? Nothing. What was the business model? There was no business model on the internet. What were we going to do? Sell dating you know, services to ARPANET scientists? What was the business model for Yahoo initially? There was no business model. What was the proven management team? Yeah, David and Jerry, what? They worked at the Stanford bookstore one summer. I mean, what was their proven management? So there's like nothing that a VC says that they want, right? And so, I too was a bozo. When I looked at Yahoo, I, I said, you know, what, how could this possibly be successful? And clearly it was very successful. So that is my personal story of bozosity. My message here is don't let the bozos grind you down. I wish I could tell you every time somebody says you'll fail, it means you'll succeed. It is not true. It is not true. If it was that easy, we would all be successful. But I will tell you, if you listen to bozos, particularly rich, successful bozos, the dangerous bozos, and you don't try, you will never know. And never knowing is the worst outcome of all. So you need to try. And that is the 11th, perhaps most important message about the art of innovation. Thank you very much. Do we have some time limit? I don't even know. Pardon me? Do, uh, it's like they're going to be a bar mitzvah in here next? Or something? <laughs> Do we have to get out of here? I mean, can we just keep going and do Q&A? Right. Yeah, okay. okay. So thank you so much for being here.
question that I wanted to ask. What do you need? Hi. What are you looking for? The other mic. Oh, the other mic. Yeah. Nope. I have no idea. So, um, may I just take oh, that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, I, I don't know, we met actually a year ago. I mean, I, I, you were signing a book, and I was taking your picture, and you were taking a picture of me, me taking a picture. Anyway, um, <laughs> Denise Grosso, uh, one of our advisors, um, she mentioned to me yeah. that you were the first early adopter of supporting a woman yes. when nobody really thought it was Well, amazing. I wasn't the first one in the history of okay. mankind. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> what I'm doing here, so please go with me. So, um, why did you decide to um, take a step to support Denise? Besides, she's obviously a very yeah. um, oh. special person. I, I think it's... it's I, I, I really test an uneven playing field. And uh, whether it's because you're a minority or whether it's because of your gender or your religion or whatever, I just cannot stand that people cannot get equal opportunity. And so now when I started the Forum for Women Entrepreneurs, um, which incidentally, I tried to convince Denise to call it the Forum of Entrepreneurial Women, because I thought the acronym FEW, which would be like a dig, right? Like, why is it so few, would be better than FUI. <laughs> but that's a whole different discussion we could have. Um, so, so she asked us for office space, and she asked us for support, and of course I gave it to her, because I, I think, you know, I have a moral obligation to try to even the playing field. Really, it was that simple. Thank you. Yeah. Good? Can you swap my computer in there? Like it's, oh. it's charging over there. Okay. Uh, Denise was the one who uh, originally co-founded uh, that led into Watermark as well as to Springboard. So she's been a huge advocate for a uh, woman to succeed in the entrepreneurship world. So, sorry, I just missed the background. Okay. Uh, you have a daughter. Yes. And uh, given all those uh, development um, by many other women's organizations, yeah. um, what do you wish for us to continue to do and in what kind of world do you wish for your daughter and any other advice to that? Oh, I will tell you that my daughter is the gating item to my happiness, which is to say I can only be as happy as my daughter is happy. <laughs> um, and as a, a, a testimony to how much I love my daughter, I will tell you something that's irrefutable. I have taken my daughter to not one, but two Justin Bieber concerts. <laughs> you think Larry Ellison or Steve Jobs took their daughters to Justin Bieber concerts? There's no freaking way. So I, I just, so my daughter, she's a very interesting story because um, we have, my the two older boys are um, biologically from us, and the two younger kids, a boy and a girl, are adopted from Guatemala. And so there's like a whole level of, you know, adoption is one of the most beautiful things in the world, I have to tell you. And so she's very special. And then, so we had adopted her, and then a year and a half later, I get this phone call, and it's the people in Guatemala. I say, well, guess what? The biological parents of your daughter just had a son. Would you like him to? Like, what the hell? Why not? <laughs> so, so that way they can, you know, be raised together. So anyway, so I, I want an equal plane for her. For this doesn't mean she has to be an entrepreneur. She has to be a programmer. She doesn't have to be, you know, majoring in STEM or anything. I don't care what she majors. She can major in Oriental art history for all I care. But I just want the field to be equal for her. So if she wants to be a programmer, hallelujah. Um, so I don't need. She doesn't need to prove anything. Uh, and besides, that, anyway, I can't. I can't. I have limited influence over her already, so that's that's all I want for her. Um, she happens to love animals, so you know she wants to be a vet. So hallelujah. Um, UC Davis. Hopefully, here we come. Um, yeah. Right. All right. Um, I would like to take a two questions from the floor. Two? That's all? <laughs> I think it's people. Oh, Are you? Continue. You wanna? Oh, oh. <laughs> Maybe I'll get a bonus. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Um, 
Oh. <laughs> is it broadcast? Is it display? Can you make it display? Can I plug it in? And because I might do a demo if there's time. Sure. I'll write it. I'll write it down. So only one person knows. <laughs> Although you'd have to find my computer and then enter the password. Um, you live two miles away. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's your question? Uh, enjoyed your talk. I'm giving my first pitch tomorrow morning yeah. for the Minority Angel Network. Yeah. Um, I had the chance to get some feedback from Bill Riker about my yeah. business model. Yeah, my partner. And it was great feedback. Sorry. I was saying I'm giving my first pitch in the morning to the Minority Angel Network um, for their national competition. You gave some great advice. I've changed the axis on the chart, okay? <laughs> now you're in the upper right hand corner? I've always been in the upper right hand corner. <laughs> it's just time for the world to see it. Um, but Bill Reichert also gave me some great feedback, social media, and make it a little bit better. Um, he's taking me to a startup competition, and I would love for you to give me an opportunity as a minority female CEO <laughs> to spend some time with you and tell you about my business. We're going to disrupt the care market, a $248 billion market. All you need is 1%. All of them, and, and you buy two cans a day. <laughs> I would love uh, okay. half an hour of your time. So That's that, my question. That can, I have, can I have half an hour <laughs> and, and an autograph on that book, the eight book? <laughs> How the hell can I stay over there? Yeah. Do, do I get the meeting? Anita? Anita Gardine. What am I going to say no? <laughs> he said he wants to open doors for women and people of color. Hello? Great background, MBA from Berkeley, and so, senior management you know what, in quantum. This is an important lesson. This is why you should never do QA. <laughs> I should have just done my keynote. You would have loved it. You said, God, he's so smart and all that. Get out of here. But no, I gotta do QA. Like, but you, you said always go for it. I, 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 admire I am you. taking I'm your criticizing you. I admire you. But does that mean you're accepting my meeting? But that means I have no choice. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, can I have a next qu question? No asking. Otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> private. Guy calls on Gmail. Right. It'll work. <laughs> Congratulations, by the way. All right. Thank you for the talk. I really enjoyed it. And I read your last book, by the way. Um, my question is: You obviously like cars, right? So, first of all, do you have a Tesla? Do I have a Tesla? No. Um, I don't have a Tesla, well, for several reasons. One is, um, I do have a second part of the question. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I don't have a Tesla. There's a lot of reasons. Well, one is, um, I have to right now worry about my Moto X phone being charged and my Nexus 7 or iPad mini being charged. <coughs> And my MacBook Pro being charged. I just cannot handle one more thing. <laughs> Seriously. Okay, so that's number one. Now, having said that, uh, Honda once asked me to do a speech, and they they kind of didn't want to pay my you know rack rate, so I offered to do it if one of the forms of compensation was an electric fit. So I have an electric fit. And the reason why I got an electric fit, I don't want to burst any bubbles, is not because I'm such a green person who doesn't want to you know, cause polar bears to melt on the ice, but it's because I wanted to drive in the carpool lane by myself. <laughs> that's, the, that's the only reason why. Um, so so then, you know, then I saw, like, I look at the people. I invented a word called test hole. Guess what test hole is the conjunction of what two words? <laughs> Tesla and asshole. So I noticed that, I mean, Tesla drivers do not, like, do not the warm fuzzy type, you know what I'm saying? They're, like, they're all captains of industry and they all like, you know, they all like, 
they feel so righteous driving their $125,000 car that's not spewing hydrocarbons. Um, so I, I just can't warm up to that. Yeah, but it's 85 for the battery that goes 100 miles. If you want to go like 300 miles, this isn't like 125,000 or something. Yeah, I, see, if I was going to spend $125,000 on a car, I would buy a Porsche 911. Because maybe that's that's the car. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, can I do? Okay, you guys are obviously not in a rush, right? So I gotta tell you a story. Yeah, you should sit there. I don't need you right now. Um, I gotta tell you a Porsche 911 story. Probably, you know, when I tell these stories, you're gonna remember the story and not all the content. But anyway, so it's about. 12 years ago, I was, at the time, um, I was driving a, driving a 911 Cabriolet, okay? So I was driving this 911 Cabriolet, and it was right where, um, on El Camino by Safeway, uh, in Menlo Park. So I pulled up to this stop sign, and I looked to my left, and there's this car with four teenage girls in it. And they're looking at me, and they're smiling at me, and they're laughing, making all the kind of And I like sat there. I said, "Guy, you have truly arrived. You know, like, even teenage girls know who you are. It's because of your writing and your speaking and your working out. Oh, even teenage girls know who you are today, guy." So one girl goes, "You know, roll down the window." Obviously, not a Porsche owner. You don't roll down a window. You press the button. But anyway, so I put down my window. And she sticks her head out of the car next to me. She says, are you Jackie Chan? <laughs> yeah. I kid you not. I kid you not. Okay, so now, you know how like, <laughs> in life, you need certain events to crystallize your goals and your motivation. Well, that was a really crystallizing moment for me because right then and there I decided that someday in Hong Kong, Jackie Chan would pull up to an intersection in his Rolls Royce, look over, see a car full of teenage girls. The girl says, roll out your Rolls Royce window, puts down his window, and the girl says to him, are you Guy Kawasaki? That is my golden life. Shallow, insipid, I understand it, but you gotta have goals. In your life. That's my goal in life. So that's my precious story. What else? Maybe why that's work. Oh, yeah, your second question. Yes, yes. yes. I know, you want to meet and pitch with the company. Uh, that's good, but hold on. That, uh, second part is so what do you think the current state of connected cars and the future of it? Of connected cars? You mean cars that are talking to each other and stuff? Like and, uh, I look forward to the day of connected cars that are driverless. I cannot wait for that. I, I think it would be yeah. so great. Because um, I know they're safer. I know they're smarter. Um, you know, like I said, I'm 59 years old. And like I could see the end already. And I just... I, if I couldn't drive, well, I would just die. And so I, I look forward to that. I, I can't wait for that day. Um, it's kind of the antithesis of 9-11, but I, I hope that day comes soon. I really, I would love that day. I think it's going to be great. How long into the future do you think we're going to see that day? How, how long? Into the future. How long before that happens? <laughs> well, before I die, um, <laughs> 15 years maybe? I think so. Like 15 years. Let's take a last question because I want to move forward. <laughs> awesome. Break my face. Man. You're like, pounding on me to come speak and now you're cutting me off. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> so, um, we all know the case for women in business. I know you're familiar with this, that there's lots of statistics that support that employing more women, involving them in the design process, et cetera, is a good thing for business. And we also know the statistics about the inequities in business. So my question has to do with how to involve more men in that conversation. I recently, through an event that uh, was investigating 
implicit bias and some of the biological differences between men and women. And I advertised it to both men and women, and 100% of the people who came were women. <laughs> and I soon learned that this is not unusual, that it's not unique to me, that uh, the corporate people that I work with who are running women's initiatives or diversity initiatives have this same issue, etc. So we're with the marketing guru here. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on how to involve men in the conversation. Okay. This is a second example of why you should not do Q&A. <laughs> I, I, really, I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, I... Can I share something? Yeah, go ahead. Take the pressure off me. I have a son who is a sophomore at Santa Clara. He studied computer science. He says to me, Mom, I'm just sick and tired of all these sweaty engineers' classes. I'm like, well, you know, he says to me, I'm going to go join the feminist club. <laughs> so I hate to say it, but sometimes advertising that there's a lot of women somewhere will attract the men. <laughs> so uh, if I could give you another perspective on that. Um, my, my, uh, so my attitude is this, that it is so hard to succeed in a startup that you have to like do everything you can to give yourself a competitive advantage. Okay, so contrary to what many people believe, it's not about creating a level playing field if you're an entrepreneur. You want to tilt the playing field towards you, right? So this isn't about affirmative action. This is about you know making yourself as as many advantages as possible. So just on a purely intellectual basis, I cannot understand why you would be sexist. Because it seems to me that it is so hard to find great people that what do you care if they're male or female, straight or gay, Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, whatever. I mean, it's so hard to find great people. Why would you put these artificial fences in front of yourself? You should just hire the freaking best people you can. And so that's what I don't understand about the sexism, because it is so stupid, it is not rational. So for venture capitalists, you know, like, why, why would you, it's so hard to make a company successful, so you're going to, therefore, just, I mean, I don't know if it's consciously or subconsciously, but why would you wipe out half of the human race <laughs> as a potential investor? I just, it makes no sense at all to me. And so that's what I cannot understand about that um, at all. Um, and just between you and me, I happen to think that women are better judges of businesses. And I'll tell you why. I think that in the DNA of every man is a gene that I call the killing gene. And so what men are predisposed to do is want to kill stuff. They want to kill other people. They want to kill other products, other companies, other services. They want to kill plants. They want to kill animals. We just have this killer gene in us. So this means when you ask a man, what do you think of me starting a company to kill YouTube, kill Google, kill Apple, kill Cisco, kill whatever? A man will always say, yes, that is a great idea. Okay? Because they're predisposed to want to kill in case. Women don't have that fundamental genetic flaw. So that's why if you have an idea for a business, you should ask a woman what she thinks of the business, not a man. Because a man will always tell you it's a good idea. And I think that is a very good test to examine the viability of a company, is to ask women, not men. Men will always say it's a great idea. It's a shortcut for you in your due diligence. So that's a long answer to your question. Okay. So can I just do one more thing here? Okay, so I want to show you a product because I just found it and I fell in love with it and I think that it can apply to many of your lives. This is a product called Canva. And Canva is basically Photoshop for the rest of us online and easy to use. How many of you use Canva already? So is Canva not a great product? Okay, so, so this is the homepage of Canva. And these are some various templates up here. 
So let's say you're going to make a post to one of your social media accounts. And so you need a big graphic. And so you click on this thing, and then we, not we, Canva puts up all these examples, and you click on something like this, and it puts it over there, and then you then get to edit this and change the text and all this. So let's say I've done all that, I've edited all this, all right? And then I click on Link and Publish, and I say I want to get a PNG, not a PDF, a PNG. So I get a PNG, and I happen to have used a template with a $1 picture called Golf and Swimming uh, Underwater, and I say, okay, pay and download that, so I'll buy this thing. And now it is creating this PNG, and it's going to save it to my downloads folder, and then I now have this image. And so literally, here, I'll, I'll open it. So now I've created that image. So you just saw me in five seconds build this image, and then you use this as, like, let's say you're doing an email, and you want to put a graphic, you know, birthday announcement, new product announcement. If you, if you found an article about saving the planet from National Geographic, and, and you're worried that if you use the National Geographic picture, you may be violating National Geographic's copyright or something like that. So that's all you have to do. And you can do it, let me go back to the home page. So you can do it for all these templates. And so we have social media, not we, Canva has social media, there's presentation mode, you can do it for this, and Facebook covers. So you know on Twitter and Facebook, you need a cover album photo, it has to be certain pixels wide and all that. So Canva has figured out exactly what the width is and gives you a bunch of templates and you can say, okay, so this is the starting point for my Facebook cover photo. And then you go back here and you say, yeah, but I'm, not, I'm really into Pinterest. So these are Pinterest templates that now you can customize this a little bit, put your favorite quote up there, and then you do the same thing. You click publish, and it's not ready to publish it, and you click publish, and you click PNG here, and it creates the image. And so that's how quickly you can create. Now, contrast that by those of you who have ever tried to figure out Photoshop. You know, how do you figure out Photoshop? What's the layer? How do you put text on top of Photoshop? How do you save as as Photoshop? How do you, like, oh my god. I mean, so this is Photoshop for the rest of us. So you can use it for your social media posts. You can use it for your um, invitations, for your email uh, marketing campaigns. Um, imagine if you, let's say you run an Etsy store and you need to make an Etsy banner. This is an Etsy template. It's going to be an eBay template. There's going to be a template for every possible thing. Um, so I wanted to show that to you because I think it's a very, 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 have you found it to be useful? Yeah, I can stop playing with this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's Canva. Yeah, you have a question? Uh, uh, very simple. Canva's mantra, I could give you a two-word or three-word version, okay? At one level, it should be democratized design. You no longer have to buy PowerPoint or pay $50 a month for the Adobe Creative Suite rental fee, right? Now, democratized design may be too broad because there's designing houses, there's designing cars, there's designing lots of stuff, right? So a three-word version mantra would be democratize graphic design. That's what that company does. It democratizes graphic design. The only place you'll pay right now on Canva is if you happen to pick a photo that is, you have to pay for the photo, but a lot of the vector graphics and all the designs are free. The second one I picked was free. So that's the, that company is in the business of democratizing design. Two words, democratize design. Uh, Mr. Kawasaki, yeah. are you going to be around? We have a reception and yeah. we have a new food arrived. Oh, really? So I know many, <laughs> <laughs> so many of you Seriously? still have a question, so thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.